Hi there, Toy here, and today I'm doing something a little bit different, which is why I'm in a different recording spot. Um, I've decided that I'm going to try to be a little adventurous and see if I can maybe do some tags. I have been tagged for the first time by Go Indie Now for their Stages of Words tag, and I'm very intimidated, but here we go. Well, you're supposed to be talking about um, basically the different stages of a story, um, how the words are used, or images, because you can talk about books or movies, whatever works for you. And I'll just go ahead and let you know now some of my answers are going to seem a little bit cliche, but these are the answers that I could come up with. Um, without overthinking it and yeah we'll see what happens so the first one is monologue or a, the greatest speech in a written work and so for this one i'm actually gonna go to movies um i was trying to think about you know a great speech in a book and there's just so many to choose from you know and so what i'm gonna do with this is i'm gonna give an example of a horrible monologue first uh, a humorous one and then one that I actually think hits the mark, it's notable, it's quotable, so that's where I'm going. So the first one that totally misses the mark for the monologue is Dwayne Johnson when he first started making that transition from wrestler to movie star, he appeared in um, the movie Be Cool where he plays a homosexual cowboy working as kind of a, a bouncer or like a bodyguard but what he really wants to be is an actor and so he does this like audition where he's supposed to be doing a monologue but really it's not it's totally a conversation he actually acts out the scene from bring it on yes the cheerleading movie with the snaps and everything and it's hilarious but it is the absolute worst example of a monologue so the next one that i'm going to mention is i think a humorous monologue it's memorable it's a great speech but in the um 80s film stripes um bill murray and um his friend i can't remember his name ivan rickman no i can't remember who it was but the other guy who was with him in <laughs> ghostbusters i know i'm gonna get some hate mail for this but anyway they were in this movie together where they were in the military and they didn't really want to be they had like some debt problems so they thought joining up was the way to go and so it's like time for them to graduate from, you know, boot camp and their squad is terrible, awful. And so Bill Murray gives them a pep talk <laughs> and you can just imagine if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's, it's, it's a great speech. It's not very motivating at all, but he basically says we're the underdogs, we're the losers and we're still awesome and we're going to rock it. So it's, yeah, it's a good speech. Um, not necessarily what you would pick out from stacks of millions as a memorable one to use as an example of a monologue. But the next one that I'm going to mention is, I believe, um, it's a very emotional film just because of the content, um, content alone, the movie Color Purple. There's so much in it dealing with, um, you know, race and sexism. Um, it's part of the our history, but it's also kind of part of our present. And so there's a lot of things, just so many not worth you know, going through right now for the purpose of this tag. But there is a scene where um, a character played by Oprah Winfrey, and um, whatever you think of her acting ability, I really don't care. In this particular role, at this particular point in this movie, she is heartbroken because another woman has suggested that she can be controlled by being beaten. And she gives the famous speech um, where you told Harpo to beat me. And she just kind of lays into this woman like, how dare you? And good for her. And it's just an amazing speech. And if you haven't seen it, if you can sit through, you know, the emotional, um, you know, levels of that movie, you should definitely see it. All right, so the next one is the best second act or conflict that set up a path for an epic ending. And so this one, um, again, there is just so many to choose from. And my mind was just reeling with all kinds of things. So I actually decided to go with something a little bit different. Um, I didn't go with a book or a movie. I actually went with a TV show. 
So if you have not seen the latest um, season of the Samurai Jack series, go ahead and just kind of stop now. Maybe I'll leave links to below where you can, you know, skip this. So I'm not going to give too much of a spoiler away, but it is kind of a spoiler because, you know, in this Samurai Jack, you know, he's, he's been stuck in the future in a world where, you know, he can't beat um, a coup because of, you know, he's closed all the portals and his magic's everywhere. And so you see him kind of doubting himself and then these new characters are introduced. The small army of these like female assassins are coming out, coming after him. And then this conflict of him having to battle these human beings, he has to actually kill a real person because if you follow the samurai jack you know series you know that up at this point all his villains have been you know robots or you know androids or you know um not real creatures whatever so this is like the conflict and being what they are not just the fact that they're flesh and blood there's more to the story that i don't want to give away but it set up that ending like you saw it coming, you didn't want it to happen, but it did happen and it was amazing. So I'm not going to geek out on that too much longer. Next one is the best third act that gave us the best ending. And for this one, I am going to go to a book. I, I are so many movies that I can mention and other people will probably mention them. Um, there are several well-known books. Um, I'm going to mention one that I think is becoming more well-known. If you have not read the Casa Star series by Alex J. Kavanaugh, do it. Um, it is a science fiction, it's a space opera, but it's not what you would think. I mean, it just, it just has layers to it. So kind of get over your whole mentality of, oh, these are people flying ships in space. I don't care about that. You would care about this story if you just gave it a chance. I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. But I would say that, it came, gave us the best ending because of the way it all came together. I mean, it was one of those things where it wasn't necessarily an epic battle, but it was this moment where everyone was on the edge of their sea. Like, just imagine all the leaders of the world with their hand on a buzzer to drop nuclear bombs onto everyone else and completely destroy the world. That's kind of what's happening in this book. I mean, they're in outer space, so we're talking about different planets and things like that. But it just builds up to this moment where these people are going to literally destroy themselves in, in this moment of clarity. They realize, oh, we can save ourselves instead. And it was, it was, it was wonderful. So the last book in the Casa series, Casa Storm, um, great epic ending. All right. The next question is stealing the spotlight, a moment when the side character basically steal the scenes. And, um... This one, I, I kind of go back and forth between movies and books. Um, sometimes I feel like more often than not, the secondary characters are the more interesting characters. A lot of times our protagonists and antagonists are just so, like, they have a mission. They don't really have, you know, the freedom to, you know, be a little quirky and odd or, you know. So I feel like secondary characters are always very interesting. For me personally, I feel like that, is the Hulk in the Avengers movies. Um, yeah, he has some standalone movies, but I'm talking about just the, you know, Avengers 1 and 2. In the Avengers movies, I feel like Hulk is the one sometimes who maybe steals the show, even though it's really not all about him. Yes, I know they're a team, but let's be honest, when most people are watching the Avengers movies, they're looking at Captain America, they're looking at Iron Man, you know, they're looking at Thor, but that character of Hulk, he always seems to have something, I feel like, that just kind of steals the show. Like when they were, you know, battling the aliens and he stops for a moment to beat the crap out of Loki. And then he says, hmm, puny god. Like that's, that, that one-liner right there was great. And there's, you know, other times when, you know, he turns around and he says, you know, he controls his anger because he's always angry. Like that one line stole like that whole scene them all just kind of standing there looking heroic and he's all like, yeah, I'm always angry. So I feel like Hulk is that for the um, Avenger series. Um, I recently saw the movie uh, Kubo and the Two Strings and um, I thought it was really good, but that's another one where even though the movie is called Kubo and the Two Strings, the two side characters 
are the most interesting characters. I mean, the monkey and the um, like scorpion guy, I'm not going to give too much away if you haven't seen the movie, but those two characters are what really drive the movie. I mean, Kudo's cute. Yeah, I like his story. <laughs> I understand it's all about him, but those two characters are really the reason why I enjoyed the film. And then this one is a, the last one is actually from a book series. Um, if you follow my channel at all, you know that I love the author Stacy Rourke, and she has a series called The Legend Saga, and it basically is these older um, stories kind of retold. And um, it started out with the legend of Sleepy Hollow, and then she, I think, brought in some references to Edgar Allan Poe, um, the um, time machine, different things like that. But in there, she has the character Rip, um, Rip Remy. <laughs> We're going to pretend like that didn't just come out of my mouth. Rip Van Winkle. And he is hilarious. He constantly steals the show. Um, and there's really not a whole lot I can say about that. If you read the series, he's in it. And he's great. So, uh, the next one is, let's see, an encore. A work that gave you more than you asked for when you started. And for this one, I'm going to go back to Alex J. Cavanaugh. Not his Casa series, but his Dragon of the Stars, it's a standalone sci-fi opera, and honestly, when I started it, I wasn't expecting it to be bad. I mean, I'm familiar with the author's work. I figured it'd be good, but I honestly thought it would just be just another story, kind of like what he'd already done. And, you know, to a certain degree, that is what it was, but it was so much more than that. This story really came at me unexpectedly, and when I started reading it, I actually had trouble kind of getting into it at first. I thought, oh, yeah, it's more of the same I mean, it's good, you know, but then as I kept reading it and realizing what was going on in the story and what was going to happen, it really just kind of sucked me in. And now it's one of those, and I don't have a lot of these, but it's one of those books that I reread at least once a year. Um, I'm one of those people who I can watch a movie over and over again, but I won't necessarily read a book over and over again. But I'm starting to, you know, start a list of books that I will read over and over again. And that's one of them. All right, the next one is confrontation, the most intense, the most memorable confrontation in your mind doesn't necessarily have to be a fight. Okay, and I have two for this, and um, they both might seem kind of cliche, um, at least the first one might seem a little um, childish, but let me explain. I feel like the battle between Peter Pan and Hook is very memorable, and the reason why is if you're Reading the original Peter Pan story, or if you're watching maybe the original Disney cartoon, I think it kind of captures it. But, you know, as vain as Captain Hook is, Peter is just as, you know, cocky as he is. I mean, he's, he's not a lovable little boy. And so when, you know, Captain Hook and his men, you know, they capture him, he's really, like, shocked. Like, I can't believe this happened. And so he kind of goes into the fight like just mad that this happened, not really thinking about his lost boys, not really thinking about Wendy. But as he's fighting, he begins to realize, I think, a very small portion of him that um, uh, his mortality. Like, yes, he's, he's this kid who's been a kid forever, but he could possibly die. And so there's a point in their battle where something, I think, kind of shifts. And he begins to take the battle seriously. And um, obviously, you know, it's a it's a children's story, so there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, blood and stuff involved in it. Um, he does cut off Hook's hand, I believe. Is that, you know, he's already cut off his hand. I feel, I feel like he cuts something else off, or maybe, I don't remember how the story goes. But um, he ends up, you know, enticing the crocodile to come after him again. So um, I just felt like that's just one of those memorable scenes. You know, you remember Pan almost, almost being to the point where he was going to lose the fight. Then he comes back and he beats um, Hook. The next one that I think is really epic is an actual fight, but it's more than just a fight. It's, it's kind of this um, relationship battle that it comes to a head. And that is the conflict between Obi-Wan and Anakin. Because... Um, Obi-Wan serves as Anakin's, you know, teacher, his mentor, um, but he's also kind of like a brother to him. Anakin has no siblings. He doesn't have any real family. It's pretty much Obi-Wan and the rest of the Jedi. And so 
all of the other Jedi are so busy and they're clouded by dark side and um, they don't see the changes the changes happening in Anakin but there's a couple of times if you pay attention where Anakin kind of not Anakin where Obi-Wan kind of questions Anakin and um, he still has faith in him that you know he's the one and everything but I think he realizes before you know it all comes together that something's not quite right with Anakin and then at the end when he, they have to go physically up against each other in battle I feel like you know Anakin is now Vader he's fueled by you know hatred but Obi-Wan is really like heartbroken and torn he does not want to hurt him but he knows that he can't let him continue and so I just always felt like that was a really epic battle I think it's kind of like you know brothers or a, you know a father having to kill a son or put a son down or something like that so anyway I probably read way more into it but I think that's a really epic um, conflict and you know fight and the next question is the greatest love story now this one I really had trouble with because I don't pay attention to a lot of love stories to be honest I mean I'm not against romance in the in the slightest it's just not really something like I've never seen the movie The Notebook. I'm just going to put that out there. I probably never will. I'm not going to read the book. I know that for sure. But I'm not against romance. There's a lot of romances that I do like. Um, Moonstruck is one of my favorite movies. Uh, Room with the View. So I don't know. It's kind of... Hmm. But I, either, neither one of those I consider like the greatest love story. So my answer to this might sound a little bit odd, but that's just because I'm a little bit odd when it comes to romance. So um, the first one... I'm going to mention, I'm only mentioning it because it's a recent book series that I just finished. So I'm, it's like it's fresh in my mind. This is not necessarily, if you ask me this question, you know, a year from now, would I give you the same answer? But I'm going to say um, the, uh, now of course I can't remember their names. It's the book, um, The Mark of the Nexus by Carrie Butler. Oh, I got it. Wallace, that's his name. Wallace and Rena. The, that couple, Rollis and Marina, I think um, if you've read the series or if you haven't read it, you'll understand that they have this just this relationship that gets kind of dug through the mud and still comes out in the end. And I feel like that's a really good love story. And then I don't know if you've read the book The Night Circus, but those two characters don't even really have like a real romance together. It's like they discover each other and then right as they're about to get together everything starts to fall apart and but they figure out a way you know and the way that they are willing to just kind of exist in time I thought was really sweet and the last one that I'm gonna kinda mention this is the one that I really feel is one of the greatest love stories that I've encountered recently it's from a movie and <laughs> sorry I hit my desk um, it's from a movie and I know you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but it's the movie itself is not a long movie. It is an animated movie, and the actual love story only takes place in like the first two or three minutes of the movie, but it's such an impactful love story. And that is the movie Up. Um, the, the old man, I can't remember his name right now, you know, he falls in love with this little girl you know, when he's a kid and they spend their whole lives together and they talk about their dreams and everything and they, you know, he's set to, you know, die with her but she dies first and he, you know, is heartbroken to the point where he becomes, you know, a hermit but he decides one day enough is enough. I'm going to, you know, carry out our last you know dream that we had together and then he goes on this adventure that is the rest of the movie up so I just remember seeing that thinking why am I watching this you know animated movie that I'm not really interested in and then it just sucked me in I mean the rest of the movie was cute and all but it was just that beginning that really just kind of and I guess because it sticks with you towards the end of the movie when you see that the old man is still out there living his life and you know doing all the things that you know his wife would have wanted him to do just makes you remember so that was me being sappy for a little bit and let's look at the next question it is the most memorable backdrop or scenery and again this one there are so many answers that 
apply for this. Um, Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, Neverland. Um, and speaking cinematically, uh, Star Wars, it's one of those movies where you can see a two-second clip of it and you know what movie it is. I feel like the writers of all those books and that movie spent a great deal of time letting those worlds, be, worlds become so recognizable. But um, the one that I'm going to mention is from a, is a book that I'm, I don't think a lot of people have heard of. It. Um, I just barely heard about it myself. I was able to um, meet the author, I think, on Goodreads. And it's a children's book called Has Anyone Seen My Brain? Now, I'm not saying that this is the most amazing children's book I've ever read. Um, it's a middle grade um, novel. And, but it has a lot of qualities in it. I think I ended up giving it like a four or something like that. But there's one scene in particular where the kids are like out floating like on a, I can't even remember if they're on like a raft or something and they come up to this tree and you know, they're having like a little picnic and they describe this tree that bears this kind of like an hourglass shaped type fruit, but it tastes like peanut butter. And the way that the author kind of sets up the whole scene is you can just, you know, you can see these kids just kind of laying around, jumping up and reaching up for this fruit and, you know, diving into it. And I just thought it was really very memorable. It was an excellent um, description. And it's the most recent thing that kind of sticks into my mind when I think about that. And um, so, yeah. And the last question is, the book that you would love to see performed on stage, and it does have to be a book. I could give you a list of a hundred different books I would love to see on the big screen, but this one says on stage. So I find that not all stories translate that well on stage. I think um, a lot of dramatic stories would come across very well on stage. I recently read a book from an author friend of mine, MCV Egan, she wrote a book called Death of a Sculptor in Color, Shape, and Hue. And I feel like something like that would be performed really well on stage. But if I'm choosing like something that I want to see on stage and I want everybody else to go out to see it and I think it would be great, I think the book The Night Circus would go really well on stage. Just the idea of the sets alone, then incorporating like magic tricks and things like that. I mean, I, I don't know why Erin Morgenstein hasn't, you know, worked with someone to make that a stage play yet, but she should. So yeah, there's my list. There's my, uh, my tag, stages of words. And um, this is the first time I've done it. So I don't really know who to tag so I'm gonna just leave it open if you see this and you like it um, go ahead and you know uh, leave it comments below and I can tag you to it I will leave a tag um, below for go indie now who tagged me so check out um, their post and that's all I have for now bye bye